Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at another video by Genesis Apologetics, which I believe is the channel I go back to the most frequently for material. If I had known that when getting started, then maybe I would have used their name as the base for the anagram for my channel name. So instead of watching Vice Rhino, you'd be watching Seeping Scatologies. That sounds like a delightful channel that everyone would enjoy. I wonder what the avatar could possibly be. Actually, I think I'm good not picturing that. Though Legiest Poisson Ace has a nice ring to it, and a fish with legs would be an appropriate avatar for a channel, but I make way too many sex-related jokes to pass as an ace. That's amazing! Sometimes I wish I was asexual. Maybe then I wouldn't have a strain of herpes. You have multiple strains. Yeah, I know I have strains. multiple strains, but the joke only works with the A. Anywho, on to the video. Is there scientific evidence that supports the Bible's account of human origins? Well, that depends very much, if not entirely, on how you interpret the Bible's account on human origins. If you take it literally, then no, there isn't. Let's look and find out. The Bible is very clear about human origins. Genesis lays out who made us, God, or Elohim in the Hebrew, what we were made from, dust, how we were made, divinely spoken into existence, who we were made like, in God's image, our role in creation, dominion, and our marital covenant for family. Yeah, the Bible certainly mentions all those things, but it's not entirely clear. The poetic creation account in chapter 1 doesn't quite jive with the ideological prose in chapters 2 and 3, and scholars tend to agree that these two stories had two different authors and represented two different cultures that lived in the area at the time, the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. I could go into great detail about how we recognize the different sources of authorship in the Pentateuch, but that's not really what this video is about. So for argument's sake, let's just agree that it's one unified creation account. If you are curious about where the different stories came from and how they ended up together, I highly recommend The Bible, A Biography by Karen Armstrong. Scripture even includes when we were created during creation week, day six, and the time in history, about 6,000 years ago, based on the genealogies in Genesis. Even if we're taking Genesis literally, there is room for error in the genealogies. There are gaps, and the people spoken of in these genealogies live for weirdly long amounts of time, so that could easily add extra time into the account. In addition to this, depending on what we're using as a source for the book of Genesis, there are different ages given for when certain people had their kids. For instance, in the Greek Septuagint text, Adam is said to be 230 years old when he has Seth. In the Hebrew Masoretic text, he is said to have been 130. These differences, all told, can add an additional 1500 years to the timeline. And we can look at the day as meaning an unspecified period of time, which a plain reading of the text surely implies. As AIG will point out themselves, the Hebrew word yom has four meanings. The daylight portion of a day, part of the daylight hours, a 24-hour day-night cycle, and a longer unspecified period of time. Days 1 through 3 in the Bible can't be any of the first three, as there was no sun to provide the light that these three definitions rely on. And in the usual attempts at merging the chapter 1 creation story with the chapter 2 story, we have Adam being created, tending the garden, naming all the animals, and then Eve being created, all on day 6. That seems like a lot to pack into 24 hours. And then there's the fact that the seventh day doesn't end with the evening and morning like the first six did, which leads some to believe that we are still in the seventh day today, which can be supported by some interpretations of Psalm 95 and Hebrews 4. My point with all this is that the Bible doesn't actually explicitly say when the creation event was supposed to have happened, and it leaves the whole thing up to interpretation. And in addition to that, the differences in people's ages depending on which source you're looking at cast doubt on the reliability of these genealogies. Add into that all the science that is on the side of an old earth, and it seems to me like a figurative interpretation seems to be more plausible than a literal one. Next, scripture is consistent about this account, with every Bible contributor in both the Old and New Testaments holding to the same description of how we came to be. So, the people in a culture that had a specific creation myth often referenced their own culture's creation myth. Is that supposed to be impressive? Spanning 66 books over 1,500 years written by 40 writers in three languages on three continents. At least 40 authors, but probably significantly more when you consider that there were likely at least four sources for the first five books that I'm sure you're counting as one author. 
And those four sources probably had multiple contributing authors. I'm not sure why the three languages thing is supposed to be impressive. I mean, if anything, it introduces more potential sources for errors, as I have heard even the most staunch believers in biblical inerrancy admit that translation errors happened. And the three continents bit is far less impressive once you realize that Israel is located pretty close to where three continents meet. What about DNA research that purportedly shows our genome dates back tens of thousands of years, far outreaching the biblical timeline? An excellent question. Using molecular clock dating, we have been able to pin down date ranges for several important events in human history, such as our spreading out from Africa about 60,000 years ago. This is done by comparing a modern human genome with the genome that can be recovered from ancient human remains and calculating how long it would have taken for all the mutations to accumulate based on a mutation rate. Or at least that's one method of molecular clock dating. There are several. And of course, this method is not perfect. In fact, molecular clock dating needs to be calibrated based on known dates for these significant events. So for instance, we will use the fossil record to estimate the divergence time of two species and then use that age to determine the average mutation rate. In all, molecular clock dating is an incredibly useful tool in evolutionary biology, but it's not perfect and requires other dating methods to define calibration points before it can be used. Recent research into mitochondrial DNA mutation rates gives the answer. This is unique because it comes only from the mother's egg, making it useful for tracing maternal ancestry. Yes, mitochondrial DNA can be useful for molecular clock dating because mitochondrial DNA is not subject to recombination during reproduction. This gives it a slower, more consistent mutation rate. Since DNA was sequenced in 1981, researchers have been studying the mutation rates in mtDNA to try and estimate when different groups of people possibly diverged. Evolutionary researchers have based these timelines on the assumption that humans and chimps shared a common ancestor about 5 million years ago. No, not quite. They would have calibrated the molecular clock that they were using, mitochondrial DNA in this case, against the known divergence of the chimp and human lineage about 3 to 13 million years ago based on other evidence that we have for that event. 3 to 13 million years is quite a range, but we can use that as a starting point when using molecular clock dating, and several different lines of evidence have narrowed this range down from 3 to 13 million years to 5 to 7 million years. That date was based on counting the mtDNA and protein differences between all the great apes, and timing their divergence using dates from fossils of one great ape's ancestor. Kinda sorta? Not all molecular clocks are the same, there are different methods of using DNA to calculate ages for common ancestors. But here's the thing, no matter what age comes out as a result, molecular clock dating relies on the fact that we have a common ancestor with the rest of the great apes at its core. If we didn't have a common ancestor, then we wouldn't even be able to go through the motions of molecular clock dating because we wouldn't have the shared genetic material to compare. And before anyone starts yelling in the comments about how common genetics means common designer rather than common ancestor, the method we use to figure out which species are related and to what degree they are related is the same method that we use for paternity tests. So if genetic similarities do not necessarily equate to relationship, then there are a lot of people paying child support that need to have their cases reevaluated. not to mention people locked up in prison that need a retrial. This evolutionary assumption counts on the mtDNA mutation rate of about one mutation every 300 to 600 generations, or one every 6,000 to 12,000 years. I mean, the mitochondrial DNA mutation rate is a lot more complicated than just a simple how many times does it mutate per generation. There are different measurements and different areas of mitochondrial DNA that are more prone to mutation and so have a higher mutation rate and other areas that are less prone to mutation. The different types of mutations also have different rates, so a substitution mutation will have a different mutation rate than an insertion or deletion mutation. And the rate is faster over short times than it is over longer periods of time, likely due to a cancelling out effect as the population reproduces, but ultimately the cause of that is not entirely understood. But yeah, at its core, the rate of mutation is calculated, and this rate can be used to estimate dates for common ancestors. Just be aware that it is a way more complicated calculation than Genesis apologetics are making it out to be. But do these evolutionary assumptions hold up? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. That's where you start getting into some of the problems with molecular clock dating. You see, the idea is that a mutation that occurs in the germline of mitochondrial DNA is a rare event. Eventually this mutation will become fixed in a population. A mutation becoming fixed in a population just refers to that mutation working its way through the population so that eventually the majority of that population have that mutation in common. The rate at which mutations are fixed in a population should be approximately equal to the neutral mutation rate. 
So if you can figure out the neutral mutation rate, you can figure out how long ago two species diverged by comparing the genes that they both have in common. The thing is, while mutation rates do average out and end up being relatively steady, they are not perfectly steady, and this needs to be accounted for. So yeah, all in all, it's not a perfect method, but it's pretty good, and scientists are aware of its limitations when they use it. Actually, recent studies have shown that the actual mutation rates are much faster than the rates assumed by evolution theory, causing researchers to rethink the mtDNA clock they depend on for forensic investigations. This discovery was published in Nature Genetics by Dr. Parsons and his colleagues who investigated the mtDNA of 357 individuals from 134 different families representing 327 generational events. Credit where it's due, this time they made it really easy for me to find the studies that they're referencing. And in what will most certainly not be a surprise to anyone, when he said recent studies, what he meant by recent is 23 years old. I found one that's a little bit more recent, it's only 20 years old, and it's larger, involving 705 generational events as opposed to the 1997 study's 327. It shows a mutation rate that is much slower than the one quoted here, the Parsons study having a rate of one mutation per 33 generations, and the more recent study, whose primary author's name I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce, coming up with a rate of three mutations for every 705 generations, or one in every 235. Their number comes up right in the middle between the two extremes. But let's just pretend for a moment that the 1997 study had the correct number. That would mean that mutations happen about 20 times faster than had previously been thought. If we were to ignore some of the known issues with molecular clock dating and just do the calculation on the whole range of when we last diverged from the chimps, that would mean two things. First, we still diverge from chimps. How quickly it took place doesn't affect this fact at all. But second, that would place our divergence from chimps in a range of about 150,000 years to 650,000 years ago, which is still well outside the 6 to 10,000 year age range that creationists like for the Earth. Which are counted by the number of times that mothers passed on mtDNA to their offspring. Parsons' team showed that mutation rates actually occur at a rate of 1 every 33 generations, which was 20-fold higher than the estimates based on the theoretical 5 million year timeline between chimps and humans that expect about one mutation in every 300 to 600 generations or one every 6,000 to 12,000 years. And there you hit on another potential issue with molecular clock dating. It relies on us knowing how long a generation is. An older estimate was given for the divergence of humans from chimps using a more accurate generation time for chimps in one study. And then, in an excellent demonstration of how the scientific process works, another group of scientists wrote a letter of response to the study pointing out several of the mistakes and unfounded assumptions that were made. And what's even weirder is that the study that looked at the generational time proposed a time frame for our divergence from the chimps that is similar to what the general consensus is at the moment, and the letter disagreeing with them pointed out that it seemed like they were chasing after the result they wanted to get rather than trying to remove their bias from their findings. I bring this up because creationists often accuse scientists of ignoring data they don't like because it goes against evolution. Well, this study kind of did that, and within a matter of months, the study authors were being publicly admonished for it. So it seems to me that the scientific community as a whole is more interested in finding out the truth of the matter than in just propping up their favorite ideas. This study was published in Nature Genetics, and the faster rate has stood fast even as the number of families in the study has doubled. I'm not sure what you mean there. Unless you're referring to the study that I was referencing earlier, that looked at a little more than twice the generational events than your 1997 study, but the faster rate didn't make it through that study. Their study showed a mutation rate that was seven times slower than the one that you showed, which is still faster than previous studies had expected, but a lot slower than the study you've been using. For reference, looking back at the divergence of the human line from the chimp line, that brings us from the 150,000 to 650,000 range that I calculated based on your 20 times faster mutation rate, up to 1 to 4.6 million years ago. And as I'm sure some of you may have noticed, there's a good chunk of overlap between the range that I just got with my quick and dirty calculations and what the actual scientific consensus is on the potential date range for that particular divergence event. I mean, in recent years they have narrowed it down a bit more than the 3 to 13 million year age range, so it's still currently outside the accepted range of 5 to 7 million years, but it's a lot closer to what it should be. Other studies have confirmed these findings since Parsons' discovery. I'm sorry, did you say since Parsons' discovery? This 1996 paper built on the findings of a 1997 paper? When did they invent time travel? And yes, they did come up with a similarly rapid number for mitochondrial mutation as Parsons' team did. 
For example, Howell's team analyzed mtDNA from 40 members of a family with an overall divergence rate of one mutation every 25 to 40 generations. Howell remarked that both of our studies, his and Parsons, came to a remarkably similar conclusion. Based on these findings, Howell warned that phylogenic studies, studies that try to estimate the evolutionary branching between animal kinds, have substantially underestimated the rate of mtDNA divergence. Yes. Mitochondrial DNA mutation rates have been observed to be faster when measured over short time spans, but much slower when measured over long time spans. And unless I've missed a more recent paper on the subject, scientists still aren't quite sure why. But mitochondrial DNA is not the only molecular clock. There are a few others, such as recombination dating. Recombination is when the chromosomes from two parents intermingle with each other to form the offspring, and it's possible to measure how many times chromosomes have been recombined. Since recombination happens at an approximately constant rate per generation, it becomes a relatively simple matter of calculating how many generations it would have taken for the amount of observed recombination to occur. And this method has been shown to be fairly accurate when compared to dates obtained through other methods, including radiocarbon dating and dendrochronology. Interestingly, in the study that I found that discusses using recombination as a molecular clock, they also point out another study from 2014 that found a mutation rate that is about twofold lower than was expected. By looking at a review of the literature, it seems that different methods come up with different results for measuring mutation rates, but in a consistent manner. So studies that look at the whole genome would tend to find a slower mutation rate than those that looked at the exome, for instance. As one science writer puts it, evolutionists are most concerned about the effect of a faster mutation rate. For example, researchers have calculated that mitochondrial Eve, the woman whose mtDNA was ancestral to that in all living people, lived 100,000 to 200,000 years ago in Africa. Using the new clock, she would be a mere 6,000 years old. And once again, you're using information from the 90s. This was a letter discussing the implications of Howell's 1996 paper and Parsons' 1997 paper, though I can see now why you're not trying to poke too many holes in the concept of molecular clock dating. You need that whole mitochondrial Eve lived 6,000 years ago in order to make the claim that mitochondrial Eve was literally Eve of the Bible, except molecular clock dating, as I stated earlier, does kind of rely on our common ancestry with the other great apes in order to work. And beside that, why don't we just take a look and read the very next sentence of the the letter that you're quoting there. No one thinks that's the case, but at what point should models switch from one mtDNA time zone to the other? And of course the mtDNA time zone is referring to the fact that mutation rates are faster when measured in short periods of time than when extended over evolutionary time. So the question becomes, how long does the fast mutation rate last? And as you might expect, a lot of work has been done on this matter since 1997. In 2009, a study that looked at more than 2,000 individual mitochondrial DNA genomes placed mitochondrial Eve at about 150 to 234,000 years ago. A 2014 study placed her between 99 and 148,000 years ago, and a 2016 study put her at 134 to 188,000 years ago. All three of these studies used different methods, and they agree closely enough that I am comfortable saying that the consensus places mitochondrial Eve at about 150,000 years ago. But there are still significant problems with molecular clock dating. The method is still in its infancy after all, so that's only to be expected at this point. So how do we know that these numbers are correct? Well, let's assume for argument's sake that they are completely wrong and that your 1997 letter that placed her at 6,000 years ago is correct, even though the very next sentence stated that we have good reason to believe that it's not the case. So what does that mean? Well, when we look at a population, if an individual successfully has offspring, and their offspring are also successful at reproducing, eventually, if this continues, every member of the species will share that individual as a common ancestor. We can trace the female lineage through mitochondrial DNA, and we trace the male lineage through the Y chromosome. I'm sure most of you have heard the stat that about one in every 200 men alive today are the direct descendants of Genghis Khan. Well, extrapolate that out, and eventually, after a long enough period of time has passed, all men will be the direct descendants of Genghis Khan, and he will become the Y chromosome Adam. That won't happen for several thousand years at least, but it already has happened for some unknown man and woman in the past. 
This man and woman were almost certainly not a couple and probably didn't even live in the same generation as each other. Y chromosome Adam is estimated to have lived between 120,000 to 156,000 years ago, and there definitely would have been other women living at the same time as mitochondrial Eve. So even if all of genetic science turns out to be wrong and mitochondrial Eve did live 6,000 years ago, that just means that she was the member of the population of other men and women whose genetics would gradually permeate the entire population of humans. This of course fits well within the Bible's timeline. Yep, it sure does. But as the very next sentence in that letter pointed out, no scientist has ever thought that mitochondrial Eve lived 6,000 years ago. The letter was merely pointing out problems with using mitochondrial DNA as a molecular clock. Most of its implications were in the fields of anthropology and archaeology, where using the faster mutation rates found by Howell and Parsons would give dates for events like our spreading out of Africa that are known through other methods to be incorrect. Also, it's worth pointing out that if a literal interpretation of Genesis were true, mitochondrial Eve would have been Noah's wife, not Eve of the Garden of Eden. So mitochondrial Eve would have lived 4,000 years ago rather than 6,000, so it doesn't really fit there either. Based on their updated work, identifying 220 soldiers' remains from World War II to the present, Parsons and Holland now have new guidelines, adopted by the FBI as well, to account for a faster mutation rate. Yes, and do you know what those new guidelines are? Well, because mitochondrial DNA was thought to mutate so slowly, it was expected that there would be zero difference in mitochondrial DNA among family members. The new guidelines are that if there is one base pair difference between samples, it is no longer labeled a mismatch but is labeled inconclusive. Studies have also confirmed that there was a massive DNA variability explosion that happened on Earth just thousands of years ago. Interesting that instead of showing the actual paper, which is available for free so no excuses, you chose instead to show an article by the Institute for Creation Research talking about the paper. Perhaps because that paper itself was far more specific than saying the genome began to rapidly diversify not more than 5,000 years ago, as stated in the ICR article. Before I tell you what the study actually said, I need to give you a bit of background on it. They took samples from people of European American descent, abbreviated to EA, and people of African American descent, or AA. And the point of the study was not to figure out ancient population sizes, but to figure out how many mutations are common as opposed to rare, and how much of an impact rare mutations have on function. So now, the statement in the study that leads to the ICR claim that the human genome began to rapidly diversify no more than 5,000 years ago is, the EA population growth previously estimated at 0.38% per generation is now modeled at the first step as 0.307%, followed by explosive growth of 1.95% over the past 5,115 years. The growth in the AA sample during the same period is estimated to be 1.66%. So they have used their data to measure the growth rates of two separate populations 5,115 years into the past. That's a neat trick if they would have actually been the same population at the Tower of Babel some 4,200 years ago. Within the time frame of Noah's Flood and the Babel dispersion that occurred afterwards, if there's no historical Adam, there's no gospel. If Adam and the fall are not historical, then Jesus died for a mythological problem and he is a mythological savior offering us a mythological hope. Yeah, I would tend to agree with that assessment, but there are plenty of branches of Christianity out there who still manage to make it work without having to deny most of modern science. The rest of their video is the usual preachy stuff about how we're obviously not animals because we're spiritual and stuff like that. So in summary, molecular clock dating is a relatively new method of determining important dates in human history, but because it is so new, we haven't quite figured it out yet. And if the guys at Genesis Apologetics weren't so keen on cherry picking their data, they could have found a lot more problems with it than they did. Like my confidence level when I see molecular clock dating being referenced in other material has dropped significantly after reading through several of these studies. But they had to minimize the problems with molecular clock dating in order to make that one sentence in the letter about mitochondrial Eve living 6,000 years ago sound like it was a scientifically supporting the biblical account. In all, molecular clock dating is actually an excellent example of why creationists are wrong when they claim that evolutionists just look for information to confirm their theory and throw out anything that doesn't fit. There have been several surprising results from studies in molecular clock dating, and sometimes we have had to adjust our preconceived notions based on the results. Other times, we have had to take a closer look at the methods used to obtain the results. 
One study finds the results supported our previous conclusion about when humans and chimps diverged, and they were heavily criticized for ignoring problems within their study in favor of supporting the expected conclusion. So at the end of the day, the research that has been done on molecular clock dating is an excellent example of scientists going where the data leads, and changing their minds when necessary rather than hunting for data that supports their pre-drawn conclusions. And Genesis Apologetics did an excellent job in showing how they are willing to twist the science to attempt to show what they want to be true, as they could have gone much farther toward casting doubt on molecular clock dating than they did, instead opting to stop looking once they got the answer that they wanted. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Kristen Wright, who says, Then there was that time about 70,000 years ago when early humans almost went extinct. It was estimated that there were only about 2,000 people on the planet at that time. He figured that into his population model, right? This was on one of my videos responding to someone who used the population growth argument for a young Earth, which is quite possibly the worst argument they have. I bring it up now because a couple of the studies that I read through for today's video mentioned the bottleneck 70,000 years ago, so it bears mentioning that there are several lines of evidence that demonstrate that modern humans did experience a genetic bottleneck, leaving a population of a couple thousand about 70,000 years ago. Which is a really neat trick if our last bottleneck was actually 8 people 4,000 years ago. Thanks for watching, special thanks as always to my patrons who are the hot air that makes the balloon that is my channel rise. If you'd like to fill me with hot air, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash vice rhino. You can also follow me on Twitter at vice rhino, and my Facebook page is linked in the description. See you next time! <laughs>